Well, it looks like it's a time for us to get started. Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. I'd like to welcome you to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Uh, today, we're very pleased to bring you the last in E4C's 2013 webinar series. We'll be starting over again in 2014. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Sharon Langevin and Samuel Alamanu. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not moderating webinars, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where I'm a senior program manager in our Engineering for Global Development Department. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Building a Successful Startup for Global Development. Education and information systems are our key focus areas that you foresee, and we're always seeking to share insights about innovative models for educational capacity building in underserved communities. To do so, we've invited today's presenters, Sharon Langevin, the Partnership Development Manager, and um, Samuel Alamanu, Assistant Manager of Compliance and Business Development in Ghana for World Reader. We thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Along with myself, we have Holly Schneider Brown, Victoria Chung, and Alex Torres of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. It's been a good year. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide. Webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we hand things over to our presenters for today, we thought it would be a great idea to remind you about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a global community of now over 16,400 technically minded members and more than 30,000 social media followers, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, education, or other areas faced by underserved communities worldwide. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies such as ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, as well as academic supporters such as MIT's DLAB, international development agencies like USAID, EWD USA, and Practical Action, as well as access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you are participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring leading-edge technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information and upcoming installments in this series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on our webinar page and the URL is visible right here. You can also check out the archive on our YouTube channel. If you're on Twitter, I'd like to also invite you to join the conversation about today's webinar with the hashtag E4C webinar also visible here. So E4C's next webinar, oh goodness, I think we had missed a slide. Ah, there we go, apologies. E4C's next webinar will be on Tuesday, January 21st, 2014 at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard with WASHTEC on the topic of From Technologies to Lasting Services, Identifying and Addressing Barriers to Sustainability. Uh, we're very thrilled to have three presenters on our next webinar, who will be Joe Smith of IRC International Water and Sanitation Center, Andre Olszewski of the SCAP Foundation, and Benedict Tufor of Trend Ghana. Uh, to learn more and register, please visit the E4C webinars page in about 24 hours when we'll put up the registration link. If you're already an E4C member, 
We'll be sending you an invitation soon as well. More incentive for you guys to sign up as members. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today. In the chat window on the right-hand side of the screen, um, please type your location. I'll start as an example. There we go. We'd like to see where everyone is from today to get a sense of uh, who's coming. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go into the same chat window. But you can feel free to send a private chat to Holly or myself. So it looks like we have folks from all over the U.S., uh, Columbus, Ohio, Texas, Virginia Beach, Cleveland, Tampa, Washington, D.C., and it's certainly very cold in Wisconsin. Uh, we feel you. I'm sure the people of Florida don't feel the same. Uh, we also have folks from Italy, Trinidad. Very cool. Welcome to everyone today from wherever you may be joining us. Thank you. Oh, Ecuador. There we go, one more. <laughs> you can also use the chat window to type in any remarks you may have. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located directly below the chat window, to type in your questions for the presenter. That allows us to keep track of all the questions. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. If that doesn't work, you can use the call-in number for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for those of you who need it for your license, please follow the instructions on the top of our webpage, um, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. So with all those instructions behind us, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. First, we have Sharon Langevin, who works closely with organizations and schools for a part of World Reader's uh, partnership program, World Reader Kits, to ensure successful projects and lasting impact. Uh, we worked with Sharon quite a bit through Engineering for Change previously, and we're thrilled to have her present for us today. Samuel Alemnu assists in managing ground operations for World Reader Gala programs. He operates out of the school in charge of designing and documenting day-to-day -day activities and out of classroom experiences with an eye towards scalability and sustainability. We're thrilled to have you both join us today and share some of your insights. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sharon. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. This is Sharon. Uh, thank you so much, Yana, uh, for that great introduction, and thanks so much to the E4C um, and ASME and IEEE and everyone who's been involved in putting this webinar series on. We're really happy to be able to be here today um, to present to all of you, and we're really excited to tell you a little bit more about what we've been working on for the last almost four years now at World Reader. So World Reader was started, um, I guess, in 2009, um, and the way the idea came about was our founder, David Risher, who's a former executive from Amazon, was traveling with his family in Ecuador. So I'm excited that we actually have someone on the call today from Ecuador. Um, but that's where the idea came from. He was visiting an orphanage in Ecuador, and he saw there was a locked room. He said, you know, what's in there? And they said, oh, that's our library. And he thought, wow, OK, I'd like to check that out. So he said, you know, do you have the key? Can I, can I see inside? And they told him, I think we've lost the key. And so just having, having been traveling with his family, his, with, he has two daughters, both of whom had e-readers on this trip so that they could keep up with their reading as they were traveling as a family, and going to a place where there, was, there were so many children who had no books at all. And having been someone who was an avid reader his entire life, he thought, wow, there's, there's, there's something out there. There's a techn technological tool that we might be able to use to, change, to solve this problem. So the, the problem that we're looking at is there are about 200 million children right now in Sub-Saharan Africa who don't have any books of their own. Um, there are schools, many schools look a lot like this. This is a library at a school in Ghana. Uh, they have shelves but no books. Um, and often there, there, are libra there are many libraries out there that do have some books, but a lot of them are not culturally relevant books or they're the incorrect level. You find, we found in one school the history of Utah which we thought, you know, how many American kids actually want to read about the history of Utah, let alone someone in Kenya or Ghana or South Africa or, some, or one of the other countries where we work. So we thought maybe we can use technology to help overcome some of these the challenges of transporting books, 
of shipping books from abroad into the country, of getting them to actually directly to children. Why can't we deliver a book to anyone who has a mobile phone or has access to uh, either a 3G or a Wi-Fi connection? Anywhere you, should, you can make a phone call, you should be able to also read a book. So that's, that's sort of the challenge that, that we're looking at is there, there are many, many children out there who do not have the learning materials that they need to succeed. And we want every one of these kids to have the books that they need to improve their lives. So this is a photo from one of our projects uh, in Kenya. Um, this project started a couple of years ago, I think in 2010 or early 2011. And what we did initially is we, we took 20 e-readers to Ghana and we said, you know, how can e-readers work? Is this something that's going to be useful in a classroom? How can we really empower teachers? Because it's not just about delivering these devices to kids with books on them. It's, it's up to the teachers and the other people in the, the communities where we work to actually build a culture of reading and, you know, encourage these students to read the books that are available to them. So what we, we went into Ghana and we said, okay, let's go into a classroom. Let's work with the teachers. <laughs> Excuse me, let's see if these students are able to pick up easily how to use the e-reader, and let's see if they're actually going to read any books. And what we found is that students were downloading lots of books on their own um, using the 3G connection, that they were really improving their uh, kind of confidence in class. We found a lot of really great initial results. And I won't go into too much detail because um, Samuel is going to take us a bit more through the detail of what we what we've done, um, but we spent a long time refining our model in the very beginning and um, coming up with a way to, you know, both provide access to books but also make it possible for these students to be encouraged to read by the, the people around them. And so we're not just providing any books. Uh, Another big piece of what we do is we actually work with local African publishers in the countries where we have programs so that we have digitized over a thousand titles. I think almost almost nearly 1,200 titles from various publishers all across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we even in Kenya alone, we've digitized over 600 different titles in English, in Kiswahili, both textbooks and storybooks. Because we're not just here to deliver any book to, to a child, we want to deliver the right books. So we work really hard, to, we, and we are, in, we are right now, we have one of the largest culturally relevant libraries, uh, digital libraries available there, both on e-readers and which so I focus a lot on our e-reader programs, just where we do a lot of work in classrooms. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later um, more about our, the work that we're doing with mobile phones. Uh, but the libraries on both are similar in that they are, they're not just international, bringing in international books. Um, we are, we're trying to get local books, as many local books as we can, on these platforms. Because it make, it, you know, having the right book, that's what really makes children want to read. Uh, bringing them a book that's really going to inspire them to become an avid reader. It's really important um, in terms of their educational outcomes in the long run. And also, you know, we, we want kids to start reading in the local language and then be able to transition over to English, um, even within countries where a lot of the, book, the digital books that we distribute are being published. Uh, the, the distribution of those paper books is very low. So in addition to providing uh, a way for, stu for students to access more reading material, we're also providing an outlet, a way for publishers to actually to spread their content and distribute it more widely. So that's sort of the, in a nutshell, overview of how we started and uh, the, the kind of components um, of the, some of the components of the model that we've developed so far. And I'm, oh yeah, sorry. So let me just talk a little bit about where we work. So as I mentioned, we have both e-reader programs and mobile phone a mobile phone application that works on feature phones and on Android. So right now with e-readers, we're working in nine different countries in Africa, which you can see here, um, to varying degrees in different countries through both some projects which are directly implemented and some through partners, um, which Samuel will explain the difference between those um, in a, just in, in a minute. And then our mobile application is being used all over the world. Uh, India is a very there's a lot of very avid readers on our mobile app in India. Um, Ethiopia is a big one. Nigeria, 
Uh, and we found a lot of interesting things um, through some of the research that we've done on the app, um, which I will go into a little bit later on in the presentation. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Samuel, and he's going to go into a little bit more detail on what does our model actually look like when we're doing implementation, what are the different ways that we work, and talk a little bit about the impact that we've seen so far. Great. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, I, hope, I hope everyone can hear me. Okay. So basically, we'll be there, we'll be there works on two main platforms, as Sean has already mentioned. Uh, our basic mission is uh, to make books more, access, more accessible. And uh, we want to get books everywhere you have mobile connectivity. And so we, we have the e-reader platform, and then we have the mobile platform. Uh, we build the mobile app in, with the in partnership with Bonnie and then uh, mobile app developer in Australia, you know, to come up with a, a mobile app that can make books more accessible. And we have about 4 million people who download in this mobile app. And, uh, and uh, uh, we, we have readers that have about 500,000 readers that are month, reading monthly on, on this mobile app. Okay, so we after learning so much from the field, uh, after our first one, we realized that the way we can actually make books more accessible and get books everywhere that we need to is to, to, is to, to, is to come up with a model that will help us launch projects in different places without without us being there physically uh, managing the program. So what we came up with is what we what we came up with is basically what we call the world without kids. Okay. And so with the world without kids what we do is we put fifty e readers, okay, uh, uh, in both. I and mean, we on each of the EV that we put hundred ebooks. And since we one of our key main drivers is uh, is local content, we have fifty local content which we work with the partner involved to to choose for uh, for the specific location in question. And uh, apart from the fifty local locally relevant content that I choosing, we also add fifty foreign uh, content. Uh, we very good content that we, we we've had in the, the, our partnership uh, with the major publishing houses like Random House and etc. Okay, so apart from the kids, which we work in partnership with uh, EOs and private donors to launch in various places, and we have kids in Kenya, we have kids in Malawi, and I believe uh, Sean is going to see more about some of our kids' projects. We also work with major international NGOs and then uh, uh, multilateral organizations like USA to launch programs. To launch, to launch programs like we have in Ghana. So the first program we, we have in Ghana was the IE program. And then we did in conjunction with USA. And then uh, that program that we have running in Ghana presently also in conjunction with USAID, Australiaid, and uh, an international NGO like World well Vision. Okay. So these are the two main ways that we, we launch our programs. We use a direct model and we use a kids model. Okay. Now uh, this interesting chart you see here uh, is, uh, is from our first program, the Army program, a year after we launched. Okay. It's, it's very interesting when you when you take a look at this chart. But uh, with access to books, the difference that can actually happen, and in the learning abilities of children. And so yeah, you see that well, when, when the control schools were tested, there was a three percent percent uh, ability of reading. Okay, and then the boys was ten percent. So the difference between boys and girls also was really wide. And after this student regain access to books. You can see the girls 
totally and absolutely closing the gap and finding gap between the boys and girls, which is really pervading in the Ghanaian society. And the world we are effect here is just founded. What is even more interesting is uh, when you go on to read, you realize that these are some of the effects that actually caused the, the results that we had. You know, taking that to the fact that this film we're taking the devices on and we read before class and they reading with their uh, with their family and all that other things like they being able to improvement in their self expression and and uh, increase engagement in reading because the device is just uh, like a boy told me one time that I was making on the floor, but it's just magical. You know, the fact you pressing buttons and pages are flipping and nothing in your stretches and you can look up words while you're reading. It's just ma it's just magical for the boy I spoke to. Apart from these things that are actually happening on every road, this the fact that they have access to books, books is actually empowering the students to become more of who they really are. So in, in the picture here, you see uh, a young man here called Stanley Beckel. And my first encounter with Stanley was uh, when I was volunteering for World Leader myself as a as a student mentor. And I, the day, on that day, our discussion was uh, purpose. And I was asking each person what he wanted to do and then he was future and why. And Stanley told me that he wanted to be a, a missionary doctor. You have one minute remaining. Yeah, missionary doctor was because it was given, uh, uh, he really wanted to help people and he think that <coughs> being just a doctor would be working in the hospital and just earning money. But being a missionary doctor would mean traveling and helping sick people. And this had been a result of a book he had direct from the, from the program. Then you also have uh, a cancer student in Sivism. Uh-oh, it, it, it appears we might have lost, Samuel. Yeah, right. that's possible. Sharon, would you uh, be able to? <laughs> okay, so I think um, maybe we can come back to, if, if we can try to bring Samuel back, we can uh, come back to the slide. But I can, I can tell you a little bit about Oconta Kate. I don't actually know the story about Stanley, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so let me just, try to pick up from there. Um, okay, so Oconta Kate is another one of the students that participated in the, the IREAD program, which Samuel had mentioned, um, was the first large-scale program that we implemented in Ghana in partnership with USAID. So she was one of the students who was in one of our, the, the first classrooms that we ever provided e-readers for in Ghana. And through her exposure to more books and participating in the, in the World Reader Program and some of the outside of the classroom experiences that, that we do, which are uh, sort of extracurricular type reading related activities. So reading stories and acting out parts of the book that you liked or writing a new ending to a story. There, we have a whole bunch of different, we have a whole bunch of lesson plans that are associated with that. Um, so through that experience, she was really inspired partly to read more, but also to become a writer. So she, she, after participating in our program, she said that she started writing poetry and she said that she wants to become the most famous writer in the world. Um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of other sort of student stories like Oconta Kate, uh, but I think the, the kind of message here is that it's not just about reading more books and doing better on exams, it's also about exposing students to new ideas and empowering them to uh, go forward and achieve the things that they they want to achieve. Um, okay, so let me move on to the next part. So that, that kind of tells you a little bit about sort of the some of the direct implementation that we've done. Um, so there are two projects in in Ghana right now, there's iRead, and then there's also the All Children, we're part of the All Children Reading Grand Challenge that was put forth by USAID and AusAid and World Vision. Um, so that's a, that's a second program in Ghana. Both of these programs are 
uh, they're, they involve e-reader use in the classroom. Students are taking them home at night to read. Uh, and it also involves some teacher training. So we're actually partnered with a foundation called the Olinga Foundation in Ghana, and they've, they are providing teacher training to, uh, to the teachers that are part of the, the, uh, both of the programs that we're doing in Ghana. And then in addition to that, we also have a couple of direct implementation projects in Kenya. Uh, part one, one that we've worked on over the course of the past year uh, is that we've been one of the partners in, well, so we've been one of the kind of, the, so there's a big project that's being run by USAID and RTI in Kenya called Primer. And it's looking at um, ICT interventions in primary schools in Kenya, looking for something that's Cost effective and can scale up. So we were one of the we were one of the kind of interventions that was being tested. So looking at giving e-readers to students in class in grade one and allowing them to have access to over 100 books, uh, take them to and from school, use them in class, etc. And we found through that study we saw that of the three interventions, the kids with e-readers improved their reading skills the most. So that was a very promising result that we've seen in Kenya. And we're about to launch a new project in partnership with the Gates Foundation, which we're super excited about. That's, that will also be in Kenya. And that is a project where we're partnering with eight public and private libraries in Western Kenya to, uh, to look at you know, how, how do e-readers really work in a library setting. Uh, we've done a little bit of work with libraries, although we've predominantly been working with schools. And we're looking to kind of do more research, learn uh, how how this can work, um, kind of where, you, you know, what's the best way to implement a project in a library. We have a lot of uh, knowledge now about how e-readers work in schools and what the kind of essential components are in terms of how you actually organize such a program. Um, and we want to have similar knowledge for libraries. Um, so I think Sammy is back, and I'm going to let him wrap up a little bit on the student story side, and then I'll keep talking a little bit more about our, our World Reader Kids projects. Hello? Ah, there you are. OK. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. OK. So uh, basically, I'll, no, well, uh, I'll tell you the story and then my line cut, sorry. So, so basically, I was, I was uh, telling you the story of uh, the, the girl in the red dress, uh, in the red dress, who has stands up as the old Mary. And uh, this is uh, what comes with Kate. I'm going to come to Kate also who now was in the house that we And then she read a book. She read a book uh, by uh, an uncle called Leo Porn. And this is, this is one of the, one of the females, uh, the famous female author in Ghana. And after I came to Kate, read the story of from the senior author. She was so inspired, she wanted to become a writer herself. And she, she, she just didn't say this. She started writing her own short stories and poems, which she later shared with the world with her team. And, uh, and uh, we were really impressed by by the feat that he had taken, that she had taken. Uh, <coughs> these two individuals, uh, Stanley Becker, after gaining access to books, came top of his uh, of his of his class and during their final exams. Okay. So he's at a different school now. And uh, I remember meeting him one time in school while doing my reading, preparing for their final exams. And he, he was telling me about the fact that uh, he'd read something different. he read something from a book. And his teacher was telling him something different in the class. So they had a, a heated argument. And it turned out that he was right. And uh, these are some of the things that sort of in the both. And we, we can measure them during our, our monitoring and evaluation uh, period. But this was to say that there's, there's so many things happening, so many things happen when children have access to books. And then uh, there's never been a better time. And the web world, you know, 
Lolly Nice is doing as we really transformation. Okay. Okay. So let me. I'll, I'll take it back over. So I. No. So I found you. Oh, sorry. Are you all? Are you all set, Sammy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, we can go now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. So. Uh, yeah, so just getting back to, to where we left off. So I, I talked a little bit about some of the, the research that we've done. And one of the things that, that we built into every single one of our projects, but most specifically the, the projects where we've been the direct implementer, is that we're always doing monitoring and evaluation from day one. We've built in measurement into what we do. Um, and so that's been a really important part of actually building up the institutional knowledge that we've developed over the past four years. Um, so that's been a big component of some of the direct implementation projects that we've done. And so and looking a little bit more, I'm talking a little bit more about our partnership program, we've done similar type of types of work there. Um, building in the monitoring and evaluation is something that we're working on right now. Um, through our partners, we've done some. Um, we've had a lot of we've gotten a, a lot of great qualitative feedback from partners through our partnership program. Um, and now we're looking looking to build in some more quantitative types of measures into that program as well. So we're really one of our big focuses as an organization has really been to to measure what it is that we're doing so that we can talk about what works and what doesn't work and know that that what we're saying is based on things that we've actually measured in the field as we're doing as we're implementing programs. Um, so through our partnership program, we've now reached I think like 25 different schools across nine different countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have quite a big cohort in Kenya. I think we're working with about 12 schools. And we reached recently, uh, about a month ago, I was in Kenya, and we launched our, our largest single deployment of e-readers so far. Um, so we worked with a school. I'll just tell you a little bit about a couple of the schools where we work. Um, so we work both in urban and in rural areas. Um, in Kenya, we just launched this very large program with a school in Nairobi. Um, so they're, they're just outside of Kibera, which is one of the largest slums in sub-Saharan Africa and the largest slum in Kenya. Um, they're just outside of that slum. And all of the students who attend this school come live, live in Kibera, or they live on the outskirts of Kibera. And most of them, many of them are HIV positive. Most of all of them have lost at least one parent to HIV. Some of them are orphans. Uh, and this school was started about uh, several, several years ago at this point. And uh, they have now brought 350 e-readers with 160, yeah, I think 100 and, sorry, 140 books each. So essentially we delivered one of the largest libraries in Kenya to the school. It's 49,000 books. So if you think about how much space 49,000 books would take if you wanted to ship it, ship physical books, it would be really expensive, and it would take up probably a shipping container worth of books. But we were able to ship that in five boxes or six boxes. Um, so if you think about it that way, you know, you deliver an e-reader to a place. Once the e-reader's there, if you want, you can deliver unlimited books to that e-reader or to a mobile phone or to a tablet or whatever the device is that you, that you want to use to access this content. And from our perspective, we're really, although we've done a lot of work with e-readers and um, so far, we're definitely device, we're, we're de very much device agnostic, and our goal really is just to deliver books at scale, whatever way makes the most sense. Um, so that's one of our schools. Another school that we've, we, I worked with on our last trip um, is in a rural village in um, Maasai land in Kenya, and they, uh, in Maasai land, many, many, there's a big problem with women attending school. Um, about only 11% of girls are completing primary school because about 90% of them by age 13, 14, 15 are being circumcised and then married off um, at a super young age. So for them, the school that we're working with is providing an opportunity for these girls to avoid female genital mutilation and also be able to attend school and finish primary school and go on to secondary school. So that was a really great experience as well. And I think we have a huge range of partners. We're very open to working with um, small organizations, large organizations. Um, we really just want to reach the most students that we can. 
Um, so let me go on to the next thing. So after the last three, four years of some experimentation and a lot of kind of building up of our institutional knowledge, we really want to scale up what we're doing. So there are a couple different ways that we're looking to scale up. One is uh, scaling up some of our large-scale work, so bringing on new large and large NGO multilateral partners. Um, so one of those is UNHCR. So we'll actually be launching a program with them early next year in a couple of refugee settlements in Tanzania as a um, as a pilot project with hope of scaling that up to a lot more um, refugee settlements and camps. So the idea is there, there is that there, there are so many refugee populations out there that are really not really don't have any access to educational materials. So let's see if we can if we can use e-readers, let's see if they are a good solution to enabling these populations to access the, the learning material that they need to succeed. So we'll, we'll be doing uh, some work with e-readers and also some, some work with tablets in that program. But we're also looking at other large-scale partners like Save the Children or UNICEF or these big, big, big players that do a lot of work in education. Uh, we have built up a large, large library of content at this point, and we want to distribute it to as many different children and families as we can. So that's, that's one avenue. Another avenue, you can see uh, the, the kind of sign board in the middle. That is from the school that I was mentioning that serves the students in Kibera that I was just talking about. So we, that's our largest deployment so far. So we want to both add more e-readers to the schools that we're already working with as well as find lots more partners who are interested in bringing our program to their schools. So we're hoping to scale scale that up as well, get lots more partners in the nine countries where we work, potentially also expand to new geographies. Um, but probably we'll know a little more about that next year. Um, but we've gotten lots of inquiries from many, many different places. And so we want to be able to serve as many of them as we can, helping them to bring e-readers potentially working also with phones and tablets at, at some of our schools as well. And then finally, we have the World Reader Mobile, our app, which you see there on the right. Um, it works on very basic phones. Any phone that can access the internet, even if it's not a smartphone, you can read free books on that phone. So it's a really simple, small application. Uh, we've worked with a company called Binu, which does it's basically working to provide a smartphone-like experience on a feature phone. And so they do a ton of data compression in the cloud, and that enables them to minimize the cost of someone, of the actual user who's downloading data on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, uh, which are some of the apps that are part of Binu, but World Reader Mobile is also part of Binu, and that's where you can read tons of free book, books from publishers all over the world. We have lots uh, material, material in tons of different languages, and we are hoping to really scale up the usage of that. So we've, we've been working on a research project on World Reader Mobile as well. As I mentioned earlier, research and measuring what we do is a very big part of what we do. And uh, so we've been working on a research project with UNESCO and Nokia to look at the usage of our app. So Binu has been very helpful in opening up their data uh, the sort of their data to us so that we can see what's being used the most, what kinds of books are people reading, where are people reading the most. Um, and I mentioned a little bit earlier that India and Pakistan, we have a lot of readers in Mexico, Nigeria, Ethiopia, we have a, a good, a strong reader, reader population in Kenya as well. Um, and what we found is that while the majority of our users are men, I think it's about 70 or 80 percent of the users of the app are men, likely because men are often the owners of, of the phone, uh, we found that all of our power users are women. So people who are actually reading multiple books a month, so they're all women. So that's been one really interesting finding. And we, another thing that we found through the research we've done in our mobile app is that many parents and caregivers are reading to their kids using, the, using their mobile phones. So about 30% of our users are already using their mobile phone to read children's stories to their kids. And an, and an additional 30% told us that if there were more content available for me, I would read to my children. And so that's a huge opportunity right there. There's a phone in almost every household. Every There's a phone in almost every community in the world. So if you think about that, you could provide content to all of those people, and they could all be reading to their kids. They could all be reading stories, reading 
romance novels or learning how to read, there's, there's so much opportunity there um, to provide the right content to people using, using phones and using the networks that are already existing out there in the world. So that's, that's another area that we're looking at in terms of scale. We are even looking at things like purchasing digital rights to books and then distributing them at massive scale at, for free, things like that. So that, that's kind of how we're looking to scale up. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've learned. So just getting back to the title of our webinar, which is looking at how, how do you actually build a successful startup if you're in, uh, in the humanitarian sphere and global development. So I think, as I mentioned a little bit before, uh, refining your models is really, really important. So build, measure, learn, kind of the lean startup idea. I think that at World Reader, we've really taken that on. We started really small. We went into one classroom in Ghana with 20 readers and said, OK, let's test this out. Let's see what happens. Let's figure out where we're failing, and let's improve on those areas. So I think go in with an ad like us going in with the, this attitude of let's look at this as a learning experience has very much benefited us. That's enabled us to be very open to making changes or adding new components or removing things that we were doing before. And that's enabled us to come up with a model that really does work that is both replicable across different geographies, but it's also customizable and, context and can be contextualized to different con contexts. So for example, one of the things that we require of our partners is that they develop policies for what happens if an e-reader breaks or is lost. And just the, the simple act of going through the process of bringing stakeholders together to actually come up with that policy is really important because it gets into who actually owns the devices, who is responsible for taking care of them, et cetera. And that's something that we learned because uh, we, in the very early days, we found that we were having some really big issues with screen breakages. And so knowing what to do when that happened uh, was very important. Um, so the kind of end of the screen story is that we worked with Amazon to get stronger screens built onto the devices. And now we don't have, we, our breakage rate is probably 3 4% across all of our projects. So really focusing on starting small, building up your model, and learning from everything that you do. So don't, not, don't do pilots without measuring. I, I think the measurements that we've done so far, quantitative, qualitative, et cetera, have been extremely beneficial to us. OK, and then second, I think fostering strong partnerships has been really important. Um, from our perspective, we want tons of competition out there. We want lots of people trying to distribute this digital content, because the more, con the more content providers out there, the more access students get to the, the materials that they need. Um, and the other thing is that we can't reach everyone alone. You know, we started out with, these, with being the direct implementer of our very first project in Ghana. And that was great. We learned a lot from it. But at the same time, we realized we don't want to be a bottleneck here. We want to be able to work with other people out there who, have, who share a similar mission to us. So let's go and find partners who want to bring e-readers to their schools. And let's create a way that they can do that without having to have us there on the ground. We don't want to be holding anyone back. And then the third part, I think, is around you know, as a social enterprise, we, we do look at ways that we can make money or make income so that we can sustain our programs. I think we're funding about 25% of our operations at this point from revenue. Um, but so looking at creating these incentive structures and revenue streams, even if they are very small and it's more of a long-term kind of propos like proposition, it's still super important. And so one of the ways that we've done this is the work that we do with publishers, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa is what we've, what we've done is created something that makes sense for both sides, right? So for us, we really want more digital content on our platform, and not just any digital content. We want the books from the countries where we work. So we go to publishers, and we, talk, we convince them that digital publishing is a good idea, although that, a lot of that groundwork has now been laid for us. And we say, OK, so we want to, let's, we want to bring these books to our students. Um, can we work with you? We take on a lot of the cost of the digitization, which is quite expensive, especially for textbooks. And then we are, we basically are, we distribute all of their content for, um, like they don't have to, we're basically a distributor and we're marketing a lot of their books by saying to our partners, hey, we have these books from these publishers available in digital form, which ones do you want? Um, and they're basically 
we're basically all they have to do is help us with the, the digital files, and from there we basically are doing the whole sales cycle for them. So from the publisher's perspective, they're just getting a check from us. They make 70% off of whatever we sell, and we also make money. Um, we make about 30% on each sale. Um, so that being said, we also discount heavily the books that we sell to our partners. All of the books that we digitize are available to anyone in the world on Amazon, um, on the Amazon store, because we, we do currently work with the Kindle. And in addition to that, our partners get it at a discount. Um, so, that, so that's one area where we've kind of created an, an incentive for publishers to work with us, uh, but we're also building in a revenue stream there. So I think looking at, looking at your model carefully and thinking about, you know, what will people actually pay for? How much will they pay for it? How much money can we make off of that? And is that something that's going to be sustaining, that's going to help sustain us in the long run? I mean, the more projects we have, the more content is being purchased. And once a book has been digitized, essentially it's just there, it's available. And the more copies we can sell of that particular book, uh, the faster we can recoup our investment in, in its digitization. So those are some of the things I think that we've learned as an organization and that I, I think have contributed to our success. And I, so I think I want to leave some time for, for everyone to ask questions. So this is just some information about if you want to get involved with World Reader or learn more about us, um, you can apply to become a partner. The, the URL is there. You can email us if you're interested in volunteering. Uh, you can go on our website and learn more about our results. We have probably five or ten different research reports on our learnings page. And then you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter and follow us. Or if you want to download World Reader Mobile, you can go to that website. Or we're also in the, the Google Play Store if you have Android. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And hopefully you have some good questions for us. Yes, thank you so much, Sharon and Sammy. And uh, for all our listeners now, if you have questions, we invite you to post them in the Q&A window, which is immediately below the chat window. We already have some questions that come in, so I'm going to move on to those. So the first question is, uh, I guess, regarding your origins, and if you could share a little bit with us uh, regarding where initial uh, funding came from for World Reader. Um, so the very initial funding, I think we were uh, one of our some of the some of the initial funding were privately donated from one of our co-founders. Um, but the big the, the kind of first outside funder that we have, I believe, was USAID. Um, the for it sits on the the pilot program that we did in Ghana, um, and that was that was super fortunate, honestly. Um, they, they took a little bit of a risk on us, gave us some money to do a pilot and see where things went. And fortunately, things worked out well, and they've now been a good partner of us over time. But, um, but yeah, I think the, that was kind of the, the break that we had in the beginning was getting those funds from USAID so that we could really do a, a more uh, like in-depth research assessment of what we were doing. Fantastic. Um, so I have a few more questions. We're going to come back to some of the business questions in a bit, but there's a, a kind of, I guess, from the engineers in the crowd, of course, we're coming back to the practicalities of power supply. How big of an issue is power availability in the areas where World Reader is working? Um, so far, many yeah. of our schools are on the grid, yeah. So, I mean, I can talk a little bit about Kenya, and then I think Sammy can tell us more about his experiences in Ghana. Um, but so far... I would say the majority of the people coming through our partnership program, a lot of them are online. So that kind of, it does kind of limit us a little bit in terms of who we're able to reach and because the people who find us are probably people who have power. Although we do mm -hmm. work with a few schools that, that run off of solar power. So e-readers are basically, the, to charge an e-reader, you need about as much power as you need to power a mobile phone. So a very small, simple solar panel can charge an e-reader quite easily. Um, and we have also developed some solar cases, which Samuel can tell us more about because the testing on those has been going on in Ghana. And we are, and in addition to that, we're also looking at other small-scale solar power systems that are, you know, hundred hundred dollars or so, something that could actually power several lights or, you know, charge a bunch of different devices at, at the same time. And we're we're actually in the process of 
we're, we're actually hiring someone, we're looking for someone who can help us to do some further development in the, in the area of solar. Um, but I want to give ah. a about. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to see if that's a job opportunity that you're going to make available to everybody to know about. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of interested folks on, on the call. So Sammy, can you share yeah. with us some of the experiences from Ghana specifically around this issue? Yeah, basically, uh, Power to the Hustle Limited, our, our Western Certain areas, for example, uh, in Kuzo, we work, we work in, we, we make sure that they have power. And so because we know of the limitation that they need some power to, you know, to, you know, get them charged the EV down. Uh, like, uh, as Alan said, we've been working to develop, uh, uh, alternative mm -hmm. power sources to make this possible, like the solar case you mentioned, which we have to be really trying out kind of thing. And it's very now pretty good. We are sending feedback to uh, uh, the manufacturer and improvements are being done and to make it more suitable for the environment. And uh, one one interesting thing about the uh, about the EV that we use the Kenyo is that on an hour that it will last up to four weeks. And so uh, we, I believe that the first setup that we had, we that had in Asia, which is on the other part of Ghana, what they actually did was that they used the uh, car batteries. Okay. <coughs> mm. And they called the point of the solar, the solar house when you had the TV there. And because of uh, the minimum, uh, the minimal power of the solar, sorry, the EV does actually need, you know, to, to work, it's very easy to find, to always find out making power sources to get them going. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to uh, kind of loop around back now from the practical aspects of the technology and uh, come back to the teachers, which are obviously so critical in ensuring that students use the EU years effectively, that uh, you know they also take advantage of the lesson plans that you mentioned. So uh, can you speak a little bit about the profile of the teachers that you are working with and uh, what type of education uh, these teachers generally have, uh, what degree of education, I suppose, and whether, um, extending from that, whether adoption of these EU years has been a challenge for the teachers um, as opposed to students. Okay. Uh, basically, with those who are we working here in Ghana, uh, all the teachers are, most of the students we work in our government schools, the teachers that are from the training college. And we have uh, teachers, uh, I, I have a term that the woman is recently, the, the, that are technology immigrants. Uh, I should say this because uh, they, are, they are not they are old, they are 50 and old. Yes. We are now sort of trying to adapt to computers and to engineering technology. But it okay. takes us a day, that is a day of training to actually get, get this pictures on board when we, uh, when we go into the school and lunch. And so uh, first of all, we choose the coordinator. We train the coordinator on how to use the AVDES. And for example, in a school that and when the head was the headmaster who is about 48 years old. And we trained him on how to use the e reader. And then he trained the teachers on how to use the e reader before the teachers trained the, uh, the children. So uh, yeah, even though some of the children have um, on the program are uh, technology immigrants in quotes, they are yeah. able to, yeah, to catch up. And they really are into the e reader technology in this very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, just to add a little bit to that, um, in addition to doing the technical training, a big part of what we do is we also do kind of project management training for the project manager that, that Sammy, Sammy was mentioning. And so that's basically around administration of the program. So at every project that we do with a partner, there's a local project manager at the school where we're, where we, that we've partnered with and their job they have a, we have a whole job description for them and we also train them on 
what their responsibilities are. So making sure that e-readers are charged, working closely with teachers and students, making sure that everyone's getting trained and that follow-up training is available if needed in terms of the technical training on the device. And then mm -hmm. also, you know, making sure that e-readers are being shared between different classrooms. Some schools choose to have kind of open library hours after school or on Saturdays. Um, so the project manager is in yeah. charge of facilitating all of that use. Um, and so we work with them to give them just suggestions on this is, how, this is what some of our other partners have done, but it's very specific okay. to the school. So the school decides how and when they're going to use the e-readers, and we just provide okay. the support to help them design that program. That's fantastic. So it, in terms of now that you have, obviously, um, such increasing penetration and access to so many um, individuals, uh, the question came in regarding uh, a little bit more coming back to your business model for the mobile app specifically, considering the fact that books are available free for the user, are there any plans to raise revenue by utilizing the user base for advertising or consumer insight surveys um, and to sell that as a service? Is that something that's been considered? Um, yeah, so one of the, with the mobile app, um, so far, I mean, we honestly, we haven't done any advertising at all on the mobile app. There's been no marketing. And so we've, we've managed to get up to some months, like half a million users reading books, which is really mm -hmm. encouraging. Um, and I'd say in terms of advertising, I'm not sure exactly what our plans are. That's definitely one route that we may go down. We're definitely looking at paid content on the app. So we'll, mm -hmm. right now we have predominantly free content on the mobile app, but we're looking at ways to get more more books on there. And one of the ways to do that is to get better content is to allow publishers to provide paid content. We're really just still working out how the whole payment process would work, because that's honestly the most complicated part. Um, but I think in terms of revenue, it would be book sales, potentially advertisements. Uh, we're actually in the process of building version, we're on, I think, version two so far. So we're in the process of building version three of our app. Um, and cool. that should be hopefully available sometime next year. Uh, but it will be a little uh, a little bit less. Uh, we've got kind of a lot going on in the app right now, so we're going to be doing a little bit of simplifying. Um, and that will provide more more space and possibility for doing things like advertising. Ah, I see. So in the interim, while, while you guys are thinking through that future direction, a uh, question came in, and maybe it's related to this, so I'd like to continue on that note, is um, the notion of selling books at a heavy discount uh, obviously requires you to establish appropriate pricing for your partner. So uh, how have you guys gone about that? What has been effective for you all in determining these appropriate pricing models? Um, so I, I actually am not 100% familiar with how we arrived at the price that we are at now, but I think it's uh, right now we're charging the same for every book. So. If you are one of our partners, basically you get access to our, our library of content, which includes both books from African publishers and books from international publishers, as Sammy was describing earlier. So the, we sell the books from African publishers for $1 per book. And for each book that you purchase from an African publisher, we'll give you a book from an international publisher for free. So we work with uh -huh. publishers like Random House and Penguin and Simon & Schuster, who all have really fantastic books, and they donate some of their books for us to distribute for free um, because we're working in areas where access to, to books is so limited. And so, uh -huh. you know, we have things like the Magic Treehouse series, which I'm sure some of the people out there read when they were kids or have read to their own children. Uh -huh. um, we also have some Jerry Spinelli in there. I don't know. There's a, there's a bunch of different kinds of stuff that we get from international <laughs> publishers. Um, <laughs> but we've we found that, you know, an average price point of about 50 cents a book is very affordable for partners. And in addition to that, we've done a, a whole ton of work working with Amazon to get, we're, we're buying uh, Kindles at probably the lowest price point of anyone. Um, we also oh. get do donations from other country, uh, companies um, for the cases, protective cases and protective skins and things oh. with the devices. Um, but when you look at everything all in, the device plus 100 books, you're paying $150. So, if you look at it at a per per book cost, you're essentially paying a dollar fifty per book, including the day. Right. Wow, that's that's yeah, that's certainly very affordable. And I'm I'm sure that a lot of folks on the phone here, considering your engineers, 
um, are probably hoping that you guys have Bob the Builder or something to that effect available on the Kindle version for our kids as well. Encourage them all to go into engineering. Um, yeah. <laughs> so lots of, yeah, last question, but now we've said because we have one minute, and uh, maybe you can share with us, considering the fact that you are a fairly unique service out there, uh, maybe you can give us uh, an idea if, if you have any competitors uh, to, to this model of uh, delivering books on e-readers. Um, some of our competitors, let's see. Okay, so there are a couple of other... So I, I would say in terms of competition, a lot of what, what's going on right now um, in the ed tech space is and kind of the e there's a lot going on in e-learning and m-learning and ed tech right okay. now. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, and I wouldn't necessarily consider them competitors per se, um, but there's a lot going on with platform developments. If you look at players like Samsung or Intel or these big technology providers, a lot of them are looking at e-learning and m-learning programs um, as kind of CSR initiatives. So, you know, right. Intel wants tablets with their Intel chips in them being used in education, things like that. So I think, you know, they're, and on the one hand, they are a bit of competition, but on the other hand, I mean, we, we can always be a content provider for, for those types of platforms. So that's really where we're looking at. We're not necessarily in it to be, we're not, that, we're definitely not in it to be the only platform provider. Uh, we're in it to distribute as much content as we can, because honestly, that's where we're actually making making income that can help spread our program much wider. So ah. I would say that uh, Samsung, I know, is doing work. Intel is doing work. Um, there's a few smaller organizations that are distributing e-readers. There's one in Kenya, which is called like Read and Prosper, Grow and Prosper. I forget. Um, and then there's some really interesting stuff going on in Zambia with tablets. Uh, there's an organization oh. called iSchool that makes something called the ZEDUPAD, which I believe is a Kindle Fire, but I, I'm not, I, I haven't confirmed that yet. Um, but they have digitized the Zambian national curriculum, and they're distributing that on an educational tablet. Um, they're, they're a company um, that's selling tablets to schools. And they're, the organization iSchool is working on developing this kind of school-in-a-box program. And there are a few other people that are doing that are working with those tablets in Zambia as well. So well, that's, considering yeah. the number of schools out there and the, the, the need is so great, I guess the more the more yeah. organizations that can get into the space, frankly, the better. Definitely. The better yeah, I mean, sense. getting more yeah. content. Yeah, more platforms, more content, I think, is only a good thing for everyone. We couldn't agree more with you, Sharon. And uh, we, we are over time, guys. I know there's a lot of more questions. And uh, if we didn't get to your question, I, I have a slide up here indicating the email address for Sharon and Sammy. So feel free to reach out and, and ask your questions to them directly or make donations or uh, I recommend partnerships as, as they're a fantastic organization. Um, I'd like to thank you, everybody, for attending. And I'd definitely like to thank uh, warmly our presenters. Um, we really appreciate you dialing in uh, from Ghana, Sami, and um, we uh, apologize for any technical difficulties, uh, that such as the nature of the gig. Uh, for those of you who are interested in receiving the professional development hours, our, our code is listed here. Please include that. Um, follow the instructions on our webpage uh, to receive that PDH. If you have additional questions regarding webinar series or would like to recommend uh, a speaker or a subject matter for another webinar, our email address is webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And don't forget to become a member so we can share information about our upcoming webinars. With that, I thank you all. I wish you a happy uh, afternoon, morning, or evening, wherever you may be. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar in the new year. Um, season greetings to everyone. And uh, a happy and healthy new year. Take care.